crack the teeth. Because we do food here. We do it really, really well. And we have a great fitness facility, but you have to pass the cafeteria to get to the fitness facility. So. Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I'm glad you enjoyed it. We're proud of our culinary staff here. So, it's my pleasure today to introduce to you Joe Chiki. He's a managing consultant who brings 28 years of experience in the charitable arena with a focus on gift planning to the Shark Group. He's spoken locally, regionally, and nationally on plan giving to estate planning councils, AFP case, and local PPP groups. He serves on the board of the National Plan Giving Group, partnership for He's past president of the Plan Giving Council of Middle Tennessee and a past board member of the Chicago Plan Giving Council. You're going to hear his Tennessee accent more than you'll hear his Chicago accent. <laughs> <laughs> He's experienced from the nonprofit side and for profit side as a gift planner for nonprofits and a big trust officer. For 14 years, he worked with nonprofit endowments, family foundations, and high net worth funds. His expertise includes estate and financial planning, asset management, and charitable planning. He is active in the community, currently serving as president for the 50 Forward Endowment Board. Look at that. You should be senior citizens. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> getting close. I'm not there yet. He's on advisory council for the National Symphony and University School of Nashville. He earned his bachelor's degree of arts and finance from Rose College and a master's degree in business administration from the University of Illinois. Welcome, Joe. All right, can everybody hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, thanks, Beth. Happy to be here. Um, <clears throat> this is a little bit different session than some of the others. We're going to talk in general about the world of ethics and then sort of how it impacts our world in the fundraising arena. So my goal is to really spend about the first half hour kind of talking about some thoughts and people, and then I've got some case studies, so I'm going to, I'm going to make you all wake up after lunch and uh, give you some of your thoughts as well. So anyway, happy to be here. <clears throat> As Beth mentioned, I'm also another member of the National Board. So uh, for those of you who have an opportunity to go to the National Conference, as Kathy mentioned, she's, of course, running our conference this year, uh, Opryland, this, this October. So please think about it. And anything. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. See, that's the Tennessee. That's the Tennessee words. The Tennessee world coming out right there. Take it to plug in. Disney World. <laughs> See, I'm, I'm going to see if Kathy's awake after that. <laughs> you won't grow up. <laughs> Sorry. But, you know, in, in addition to that, any feedback for any of our local councils, things that you feel like we can do better as an organization, we would welcome any input. You know, we tr truly want all these groups to be growing and thriving, and uh, we want to help in any way that we can. So, okay, so let's jump into the world of ethics. Um, so, obviously, the first person we think of is our wonderful Mr. Madoff. Um, as you probably know, there was a lot of money, but the thing that always surprises me is he, he was involved in a $50 billion Ponzi scheme. $50 billion with the deal. Our president always talks about capital campaigns. A billion dollars, if you're trying to raise a billion dollars, that's a thousand million dollar givers. So in a $50 billion, it's unbelievable to think about how much money was, was, was involved in this and what an impact it had on our, our society. So, I think this is a message that <clears throat> we've got to continue to look at it from a broader perspective and find ways for us to keep these things from happening again. And then we get into the world of politics. Blagojevich, of course, the governor of Illinois, who tried to sell the Obama seat. I think the thing that really bothered me the most about this is that his entire campaign, because of all the challenges and all the ethical issues in Chicago in particular, of course, in Illinois, was all about ethics. He stood up from day one and said, everything, I'm going to change the landscape. I'm going to do all of this the right way from day one. And he did. So, you know, what does it say about it? It just amazes me that he was able to do as much as he did. The other sideline of this story, I have a really good friend who is a long-term friend of his brother. And you may not know the story, but his brother, he brought, convinced his brother, Rob, to uh, join him about six or seven months before all this blew up. And this poor guy ended up spending almost $2 million in legal fees and it destroyed him financially. And I really don't think he was, I don't think he knew what was going on. I guess we'll never really know that, but a really sad story. Of course, then we get into the world of sports and Lance Armstrong, who won all of his awards, seven Tour de France's, and lied and lied and lied and lied and lied. And then finally, where they were able to you know, get 
enough evidence against him uh, to find him guilty. <clears throat> but it's just really unfortunate. It seems to be more prevalent in sports, maybe, than anything else in terms of what, what happens. Of course, then there's Alex Rodriguez in the baseball world. You know, he signed his first contract with Texas. They paid him $250 million when he first started playing. And he's not only done the drug thing once, he's done it twice. And he's still back out playing. In fact, he just hit his 660th home run a couple of weeks ago. And it almost got no, no, nobody even really talked about it. Because nobody really wants to go there. There's just they, nothing. They did yeah. talk about it. Because wasn't he supposed to get a bonus? For right. that milestone, yes, and they didn't did. want to give him a bonus right. because he did it. But part of it was while he was. He got noise because of the right. fact that they didn't want to have to pay him for getting that far. Um, did they pay him? You know, I don't think they had any choice. Oh, okay. So I think eventually, but then they sort of. I think the Yankees sort of downplayed that whole thing. They didn't want to. They didn't want to pay him, but I think they had to. So. Um, and then the latest, and of course, the world of athletes. We can't, can't, can't forget Tom Terrific. Who, and I think the part that really was classic for me about this is when they finally got him to give up his personal cell phone, and there was a text between him and the guy who took the footballs up to the other bathroom so he could take, take the air out of the footballs, and the word deflate was in the text. And I guess what surprised me is that you would think the Patriots would have been smarter than this. They actually, their line for management when the word deflate was found in the text message was, well, you know, he was trying to lose some weight. <laughs> I mean, do we really believe that? I mean, now, I, maybe the, the, the owner finally got smart and decided, I'm going to pay the fine and we're going to move on. And is he still playing? Oh, yeah. He will now apparently be suspended. Is it, is it four games to start the season? That's before the appeal. Well, he's appealing, of course. But... Um, you, you want to tell me you couldn't feel that that football felt different? Come on. So what happened when the football was deflated? Well, he had smaller hands, so it's easier to grip the football. Oh, okay. So that was the big reason behind it. Well, oh, that's the so assumption. Even hands. Yeah. <laughs> relative, even hands. Relative to traditional football. <laughs> so. But you know that he knew there was a difference. You know, and, and the, the other, you know, the guy went, there's a bathroom in the main locker room, and the guy had to go up three floors to a separate one because he wanted his privacy. And he just happened to take all the footballs with him. And that's when he deflated all the footballs. Yeah, that's hard. Well, all the ones that they were using. Like 12 out of 13 or something. Yeah. So, I don't know. You know, it's just another story. Now, here's what's interesting. I've put all these men up here. And I love, I love input for some, but I had a really hard time coming up with women. Who really are no no you know who's really are really known for being doing unethical things? Well, we're not. That's the point, Dorothy. I mean, I think you know Martha Stewart. I came up with Martha Stewart. Martha Stewart. You know, but she's not. You know, she did her time and she's out now. Yeah, she really did. I think she made money off of that transaction and she knew more than she should. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I mean, don't we? I mean, if you're honest, you're poor. <laughs> but there ha I will say this: that there, there are several books. It's interesting. There are several books that have been written now that talk about how women are more ethical in the workplace than men are. And and traditionally, women who lead companies have employees who work more ethically and are more honest about what they do. So, interesting point. And then, of course, the final one: we can't we can't not forget the the federal, the international soccer world, um, we should get the official red card, right, for all that they've done. Um, they, you know, I think the thing that amazes me the most about this is that it was going on, they now have records, for 24 years, people! They were making these deals for 24 years, it took us that long, and supposedly the FBI is now the one who's involved. Is our FBI really that bad? 24 years? I mean, the guy who was the leader was there for 17 years. Okay, so the deal is, uh, it's basically fraud, but the biggest issue is, you know how the World Cup is awarded every four years for soccer? Essentially what was going on is that the countries who really wanted to have the World Cup there, the most notable being South Africa, paid members of the board of, of FIFA to have it in their home. And in fact, the really interesting thing about the South Africa deal is it was a it was like a $20 million transaction. They were, and they agreed to give $20 million so they could get the World Cup there, right? Well, then they went to them before the World Cup started. They didn't have the money. And so 
so here's what happened. So they got all this money after the World Cup as part of all these deals, right, with all these so soccer, soccer sponsors. So they shelved off about $20 million that they shipped to a Caribbean bank. You know, it was all this shell game they played. But they really never actually gave them the money. They only gave them a share of the money they made when the World Cup was there. But <clears throat> there's all kinds of evidence now. I guess the good news is the guy who is the current president didn't resign a couple of days ago. Bladder is his last name. And uh, it's a, the bladder matter, that's the phrase they're using. Oh, no. But um, so at least to his credit, he, he just got reelected five uh, last week for his next term. And he finally, after all this blew up, said, that's it. I'm, I'm going to step aside. It'll be interesting to see what happens next. But of course, the United States, I think, candidly got involved in this because they haven't been awarded a World Cup in years. Because they haven't been paying the deal. So they figured all these other people were paying money for it. Uh, so anyway, I, but it's an example of how it doesn't just happen, obviously, in our country. It happens all over the world. So now we're fortunate to live in a world where <laughs> we get to work with all these little ladies who are honest and they just do their thing and they tell the truth. So there's nothing, I mean, this is like one of our typical donors, right? <laughs> Living life, letting everybody. Right. But so it's a household. And I always give a hard time. But you said, you know what? I want to live to be like George Burns. <laughs> George Burns, there you go. Smoking yep. cigars. And, yep. and this is an interesting fact. One of the things we do as a company, we're always looking at population studies and some of those things. There are now 50,000 people in the United States over the age of 100. 50,000. What's also an interesting aside is there are 50,000 people in Japan who are 100 years old. When their population is, what, about a third of ours? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of interesting in terms of how you look at it. The other really fascinating part is that historically, in terms of um, age, you know, increased life expectancy, essentially, for every five years that pass, life expectancy is increasing by one year. So in 1970, women were looking to be in the late, late 70s. I mean, uh, early, early 70s, and now it's in the early 80s. Um, so that's one of the details we see. The other thing that's interesting is the gap between men and women now is starting to narrow. It got to as much as almost 11 or 12 years. Now it's closer to six, six and a half. Now, some experts are saying that that will almost disappear in the next 20 years. We'll see if that's true or not. Well, I think <clears throat> I think it's an ethical question. It is. <laughs> well, that's, that's actually a really great point. Here's the reality. Dorian has asked us, why, why, do men, why are men living longer now? One of the reasons is because all the research that was done for cancer and for heart and all these big organizations, most of it was done to benefit men, not women. <laughs> now, the other reality is that women, I think, are more working and work, you know, working outside the home more, so there's more stress there. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of different factors that, that flow into that. But, and say, well, I'm sorry. I would suggest they might have some of the same challenges. Yeah, more stress. Uh, but more and more women now are being, you know, because they're working or doing the research. So, you know, the good news is I think there's going to be more research done for breast cancer and some of those other things that are specific to women. So, I think you guys are still going to. My wife's older than I am. I said, I'll be lucky to live as long as you She's about three years older than I am. That was, that was the strategy. Okay, so now let's talk about the legacy world and why some of these people who maybe didn't have the best life turned it around later in life. So Alfred Nobel, what's fascinating about this guy is he patented, he had 85 patents in the explosives business in the 1800s. He was basically considered to be the father of dynamite. But why do we remember him? Because of the Nobel Peace Prize. He left all of his money in a traditional bequest to set up the five Nobel Prizes in the late 1800s. And we really remember the Nobel Peace Prize more than anything else. So the message is, it's never too late. <clears throat> For those of you who are not familiar with Danny Thomas, who started St. Jude Hospital, um, you know, he was an entertainer. He was far from the most ethical guy, let's be honest. Um, he was sort of the Jerry Seinfeld comedian of the 50s, for those of you not familiar with him. So, well, he was the classic entertainer. Um, he didn't live the cleanest life, let's just say that, okay? And, and I can say that. Actually, my first job as a gift player was with St. Jude Hospital in the 1980s. And I had the privilege to meet Danny and some of his cronies during that era, so I can speak from it. He was an amazing guy, uh, but he was a real character. Um, in fact, a lot of the people he wanted to meet that were 
he wanted me to meet with that were supposed to be really wonderful flame giving prospects were not. <laughs> but I can share some fascinating stories about that. But anyway, the good news is, why well, do we remember Danny Thomas now? He set up a children's hospital, you know, that's known all over the world. They say one out of every five people now would give money to St. Jude. The other incredible thing about their plan giving program, when I worked there, I left there in 1985, they were raising about $5 million a year in plan gifts. Um, last year, they raised $142 million. That's realized money coming in the door for traditional plan gifts, the majority of which are simple bequests. More amazingly, they had 20, settled 2,752 estates. They had eight full-time, I was actually responsible for all estate distributions when I was there in 1985. Now they have seven full-time attorneys who do nothing but handle estate gifts. So they've raised over a billion dollars in plain gifts. It's built the entire infrastructure of the organization, the research facilities and everything. Because originally they started, for, as you may remember, they originally started out doing just work with childhood leukemia patients because that was the biggest need back in the late 60s when it was developed. Now they work with any illness for, for someone under the age of 18 that's considered a, you know, a catastrophic uh, but the other fascinating story, I don't know if you've heard the story behind St. Jude Hospital, just real quickly, but so he was essentially a down and out entertainer, but he was very Catholic, and he went to a bishop in Chicago who was one of his really good friends and said, if I'm ever successful, then I'm going to do something in honor of St. Jude, who is the patron saint of hopeless causes. So when he became successful, he went back to the same bishop and said, you know, what can I do? Now I'm ready. And he said, we need a children's hospital in the southeast. And the bishop who he was working with was from Memphis, Tennessee. So that's how their original facility came to Memphis. So the historical perspective there. Andrew Carnegie, railroad baron. You know, you could talk a lot about early days and all the different things he did to make money. But of course, now we remember it for Carnegie Hall. A lot. He built, what, how many libraries across the country now? Hundreds of them. I mean, they're all over the country. So um, Carnegie Mellon, other things. Um, and then this is one final piece here. This young man, <clears throat> at seven years old, had one goal in life, he wanted to be a sheriff. He went to his uncle to make this happen. <clears throat> he actually was diagnosed with cancer at six and a half years old. But what's fascinating about this is he was the first wish granted for the Make-A-Wish Foundation. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about some of the financial stuff and some of the ethical stuff that happens in our world. Okay, so you, you got to have your conversation with the advisor. I think, <clears throat> and I see this a lot now on the, on the consulting side, some of the advisors are, are much more knowledgeable than they used to be, but some of them still don't fully understand what's necessarily in their client's best interest. It's not always donor-centric. So <clears throat> you talk to the donor, and they're all excited about maybe this charitable trust they can do for you, and then you get a call the next week, and they say, well, I talked to my advisor, and he says, it's not in my best interest, I can't do it. So the message really from an ethical standpoint is you've got to include as many parties as you can from the beginning when you start having some of these conversations, even if it's a simple gift. Um, they've got to be involved in the process. And I also talk a lot about family. Um, I actually have a, a donor, we had a real issue about three months ago. She actually has a long-term donor who's in her early 90s. She's now in a nursing home. She's still mentally competent. She just has a lot of physical issues. And her daughter got in the middle of her gift to the charity. It's actually a hospital that she was going to give money to. And the daughter essentially called the gift planner and said, don't ever come see her again. You are taking my money. You cannot have my money. So just keep, so, but I, I think an illustration, of, obviously it was in the mother's, and it was the mother's intent, it was her wish. So what we ended up doing was where she actually had, the 92-year-old had a 35-year-old financial advisor who had been working with her. So we scheduled a meeting with the 35-year-old advisor, the mother, the daughter, and the son who were all involved to have a discussion. It was her opportunity to communicate why she was going to do what she was going to do in her estate. Obviously, the, written, the documents were also written down. You know, she had a written document she prepared that shared all of her, and, and it included her family, but it didn't leave everything to the family. Um, <clears throat> so again, opportunities to talk about doing the right thing. Um, if you have someone who doesn't have an advisor, and I think this is a bigger issue too, you can't just say, well, this guy's great in town, let's, let's let you go talk to them. I think you have to really step back and recommend at least three people they can work with. 
You don't want to look like there's a conflict of interest there. Um, and that's a question we get maybe more, more often than we think in terms of someone who may be just doing a simple will who could be a significant gift. Um, I think, and again, as you can probably tell with my Southern background, I'm, I'm always sharing stories. And I think that's what I do more than anything else. And it's better to explain to somebody, somebody else who's done this. And that's, of course, what we do in a lot of the custom newsletters and those kind of things. But sharing stories with people can be less threatening and maybe help them move forward in their decisions. As I said, involve family and encourage her to talk so. Okay, so what's right for the donor? Is it too much money? How many of you had a situation where you had an older woman, maybe on a limited income, who wanted to make a significant gift, and you weren't sure if they could afford it? Right? So what do you do? Right. No, I think you really, I mean, maybe there's an opportunity to involve a family member right. or an advisor right. to try and, if you're attorney or, or their attorney. Mm -hmm. um, but we all have situations where they really want to do something that maybe they can't. So we still have to make sure it's in their best interest. Is it an irrevocable gift or a revocable gift? Maybe in a lot of cases a traditional revocable bequest is the best answer. They're still going to make a significant gift. Maybe they can't do it now. Now I do think a lot of older women are probably overly concerned about future health care concerns. And they're concerned about whether they're going to have enough money. And I've met with women who are worth 20, 30, 40 million dollars and don't think they have enough money. So part of it's their perception and their belief. Uh, maybe they're just not comfortable with money. And I've had other, other people, I've worked with a woman who, when I was at the University of Illinois, and she was, <clears throat> she was the uh, chair of the nursing department for about 12 years, but she had worked for five other universities. So she had just moved around the country, never married, and fascinating story that she had, a, she had connected with a, with her words, a stockbroker at every place she'd been. She'd been to six different institutions. <clears throat> and she had never counted her money. She had no idea how much money she had. You know, classic little black book. We finally sat down and started adding up all the money. She was worth three and a half million dollars. She had no idea. Because she was a saver. She never probably made more than forty or fifty thousand dollars her whole life. But she bought a lot of stocks and held them for a long period of time. What was fascinating is when we started talking about life income plans, <clears throat> she was interested, but we had to really be careful about how much money we kept aside for future health care concerns. So there needs to be a broad discussion with everybody that it impacts. But it can be a little difficult when you have somebody who doesn't have any family. You know, she was 85 years old when I first met with her. Uh, but a great story, she ended up creating the first chair, she created the first Dow chair of our nursing school. And it was a wonderful story, and we were able to work through all this. In many cases, maybe a revocable gift is still the best thing for them to do, whether it's a traditional revocable trust. How many of you heard the name Russell James? Has Russell been here? You'll have to get Lori to, to bring. Russell James is a professor of Texas Tech. And if, you've not, if you're not familiar with any of this information, write this down. His website is called EncourageGenerosity.com. And he has been speaking around the country for about a year and a half now. And it's the first research we really have with longitudinal information on charitable bequest. So historically, we got most of our data from the IRS. So after people passed away at that point in time, how many people left money to charity? But Russell, he's connected with the group. They now have 20 years worth of data. And essentially, they start interviewing people when they're 50 years old, and they say, are you going to leave money to charity or not? Then they interview them again two years later, and then two years later, <clears throat> and then all the way through until they pass away, and then they interview family or whomever after that to find out what they did or didn't do. And the question is, are you going to do something, or have you done something? In his research, 80% of the people in the United States, it's real similar numbers up there were quoted about Michigan, 80% of the people in the United States give money during life, but only 6% of that. And why is that number so small, and how can we change that? What do we do? What can we do to change that? So that's sort of his mission in life. And one of the things he does, which is really fascinating, is he does... He has a neuroscience background in addition to everything else he's done. So he brings people in and hooks them up and says, are you going to leave money to share? Yeah. Now let me ask you, let me, let's talk about your father who may have you know, had a major illness or somebody in your family who had, um, had an illness, maybe it was cancer, maybe it was whatever, right? And bring that memory up. And then he'll ask you a question. Now are you going to do something? 
So those memories bring up all kinds of color codes in the old brain. So he's doing all this research now to figure out what we ask people to get them through a series of questions. Maybe not a lot different for those of you who heard Melody Morton speak earlier. You know, there's sort of this whole process to get them through what you're going to do with your life and why when it gets into that legacy. But he has some wonderful research, and all of it's free and available out there. Um, and I would highly recommend as a speaker if you have an opportunity to bring him. He's a wonderful speaker. Or just go to the National Conference. <laughs> or you can come to the National Conference and operate. The National Conference. Well, the did have some other people. He went to a webinar. Yeah. All right. It was a webinar. Is that right, Gloria? Yeah. Okay. Well, he's an amazing guy. So, anyway, obviously, some discussion about tax benefits. I mean, there are some legal issues you have to make sure you get right. You know, it, as simple as, you know, I, I think the other message here is transparency is so important in our business. Now, we've talked about how it's important for you to be honest and ethical. Uh, but everything that your organization does has to fit in that world. Um, make sure they understand what their tax benefits are. Make sure they understand whether the gift is going to help current purposes or whether it's going to be for endowment. Um, and make sure their wishes are carried out. It sounds simple, but a lot of times they may have some very specific ideas about what they want you to do. Um, and you want to make sure that you carry that out at, at all as possible. Because they, this is, in a lot of cases, particularly in our world, their legacy. What do they want their legacy to be? They may be very specific about that. And, and we all know typically the larger the gift, the more restricted it's going to be. So that's the battle we all deal with. But we want to deal with what's right for the And then, of course, the final one is anonymity. We have more and more people that do want to you know, remain anonymous. Okay. Um, I had a donor, a 93-year-old woman, who wanted to do a five-year annuity. And her <laughs> but, you know, I had to tell her no, but she was all yes. It was just not good news. That she was part of it because she was that age. Yeah. Well, you know, but the re here's the experience I have had, though, Kathy, is that most people who want to do the deferred gift annuity are doing it sort of a safety net, yeah. but don't need the money. Oh, yeah, she's interested, yeah. but I just, I always think that it's never pretty old. There's tax benefits. Right. Well, you know, in a lot of big gifts, they can't even, they don't even, they don't even benefit. I mean, you know, let's face it, the estate tax world now, it's 5.3 billion, I mean, 5.3 million per person, but they're married, you know, you're easily above 10 million before you got any federal estate tax issues anymore. Now, at an income tax level, certainly there are factors. And I think that's the big wild card in our world right now is the non cash gift world. The number of people that are making gifts of stock now, and making gifts of real estate that are funding life income plans has just exploded for this one we seen. And I think we're going to see even more of that this year unless something dramatic happens. Um, so, you know, try to remember, you just, plan giving is not always about a simple deferred gift. There are opportunities to talk to people about doing things now. They may be able to do more than they think. I actually had, I did a presentation to a board last week, and I was really surprised. The guy, it's a group of physicians, and the guy was 64 years old, and I was talking a little bit about make sure you communicate to people they can give appreciated stock. They don't have to pay the capital, capital gain tax. They can go out if it's one of their favorite stocks. They can go out back out the next day and buy it. You know, there are no tax implications there. And he said, you know, I'm so glad you brought that up. He said, I really understand all that. But my advisor got nervous because the market had done so well in the last couple of years. He sold a bunch of my investments, which he had authority to do the last week of December. I didn't realize I had a capital gain tax issue until February of this year. But that's partly my fault because I had all these charitable gifts that I wanted to make. I should have talked to him four or five months ago and said, I'm going to give X to this and X to that. We should have given securities. I didn't do it. But I know that. It just didn't happen. So I think there's more of that going on now. Um, I mean, if somebody wants to give more than that, here's my tip of the day. If you have somebody that gives you more than $1,000 in a check, and I know this may not always work, but there's an opportunity to pick, don't cash the check. Pick them up and call them and say, do you realize that you could give stock, you have any stock that's appreciated, you could make that instead of this cash gift? And what are they going to say? No, just keep in mind. Probably. But they're going to, what are they going to think about you? There's a great ethical message. You're doing what's right for them. You're sending them a message that you're concerned about what's in their best interest, which will score great points. <clears throat> and maybe that's how they'll make a gift when we sign. Okay, so we've talked about unrestricted versus restricted a little bit, but of course in the charity side of the fence, obviously we want unrestricted gifts, if at all possible. 
And the bigger and bigger gifts, of course, may become more restricted. So you've got to have conversations with them. I had one donor, and she wanted to make a $5 million gift to an organization. It was a church. And it was to make sure they had flowers at all of their events. That is a lot of flowers. <laughs> and we finally had to sit down. And we had to have a meeting with her and say, this is fabulous, and we're so excited about all this, but we, we just don't need that much money for flowers every year. So, you know, it allowed a conversation to then lead to a discussion about something that was similar, and there were other things that she could do. Um, but, yeah, I mean, you just have to, you have to also do what's right for the institution, how that fits into your long-term vision. You know, what, what are you trying to accomplish, and how can it help them? And maybe it's a simple endowment gift. They've been giving money for years, and it's an opportunity to talk about their legacy, how they can endow what they've been doing. That's an obvious. But maybe it can be more complex. Maybe there's something unique. And, you know, again, as Melanie was talking about today, there's opportunities to really sit down with people and listen to what they want to do and then figure out how it fits into your institutional priorities, the word that we hear many times, I'm sure. How do you, how do you balance that? <clears throat> how are you going to keep everybody happy in the house, whether it's current or down? And again, the whole revocable, irrevocable. You know, the whole campaign game now. I, you know, it's interesting, when I first got in this business, nobody counted playing gifts and capital campaigns. And I think it's really interesting. I think it's going to be fascinating to see what happens in the next 10 years. I mean, I, I um, was talking to somebody recently. How many, well, I guess I can ask this group, how many, how many organizations have you heard of in the last few years that had a billion-dollar campaign in the state of Michigan? There are multiple institutions, right? And they're not just asking for people. It's not people that just live in Michigan. It's people who live all over the country, right? I mean, I, I was just in Chicago. The University of Chicago has just announced a three-and-a-half billion-dollar campaign. Northwestern's talking about a $4 billion campaign. I uh, do some work with Vanderbilt. They're talking about a $3 billion campaign. I mean, all these billion-dollar campaigns, and they have this plain giving piece. You know, historically, what I've seen is they'll count plain gifts for everybody 70 and over if it's a revoke or if it's a traditional request or that kind of thing. Well, now all of a sudden it's coming down to 65. Maybe it'll be 60. Maybe it'll be 55. You know, then the other big question is, okay, let's assume you had a campaign 10 years ago and somebody told you that you were in your will. Is it worth more money now? Hopefully. Maybe you can count the difference between the two, but you really, it's not fair to count all that whole gift again. Right? So I, I think the counting game is going to be really interesting. All the campaign consultants won't touch it. They don't even want to go here. Yes? I never heard about that. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. I think most capital campaigns now, the plan gift piece is somewhere between 20 and 30 percent of the goal. Oh, the big so, so you would have to state it up front. You can't just add on to the campaign. Well, I think that what happens is, let's say it's a billion dollar campaign, so your goal is to raise maybe 200 million in plain gifts, and you only raise you know, 600 million. So how are you coming up with the other 400 million? I think there's some real games being played by enforcement staff and where oh, organizations yeah, are. They're stretching that plain gift number to reach their goal. So is it, and, you know, here's the reality. If it's a simple request, is that money going to be guaranteed to come to your institution? Of course not. It's a revolt. They can change it anytime they want. So it's not. It's not really real money. Um, but it, it's this whole game that's being played now about trying, you know, the, the higher-ups are trying to make everybody happy and reach their goal. I mean, Vanderbilt's a great case in point. Their last campaign was $1.5 billion. There's a woman by the name of Martha Ingram. You may not know that name. It's a closely held company. Um, but she and her family alone gave $300 million to Vanderbilt for their one point. At the time, it was the largest gift by an individual to an institution across the country, right? It was part planned, it, although it was, it was real money. But the, the, the message is, if they had one person give them $300 million to get to a $1.5 billion campaign, how can they then go to a $3 billion campaign seven years later? They're not going to get another $300 million from her. You know, so again, as I was talking about, a $1 billion campaign, you've got to have 1,000 people give you a $1 million. Now, maybe you get a few people that can give you $10 million, but there are not that many gifts out there. Let's be honest, that are 20, 30, 40, 50, they got 300 million from one person. How are they factoring that into their, and of course, I don't work there, trust me. But, um, but I just think it's fascinating to see where all that's going to go. And it's an ethical issue. It's a big issue in terms of, you know, I think you have to be, you know, very transparent as, a, as an organization. I mean, how many of you have information about your financial status on your websites? 
to talk about how much money, I mean, to, to actually share what are your administrative expenses as an organization? You know, how transparent can someone look at your organization and know what, you know, the dollar they give you, how much is actually going to go to, your, to the benefit of your institution? I mean, I think those are little things that are becoming more and more important for people. Um, let's see, life versus, here's, here's, I guess, just a quick comment about what I think we're seeing in the trust world. Uh, Vanderbilt's a good example. I do a lot of work with them. They, they're, as they're launching this campaign, so they have people that have set up Remain Your Trust gifts. So someone said, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set this trust up. <clears throat> it's going to pay me 5% for life. I'm 62 years old. And, you know, at the end of that period, then the remainder is going to go to Vanderbilt. Well, <clears throat> Vanderbilt's now gone to everyone that they set up, and they've had quite a few charitable trusts out of it. They've gone to everyone who has set up a life income arrangement that they think makes sense and said, would you consider terminating your interest? So it becomes, so the trust gets terminated, it'll be your campaign pledge. And they have actually had about a half a dozen of these people that have gone and talked to them. They said, you know, we don't need the income anymore. We'd love to be able to do this. So what's the message? The message is I think there's opportunities to talk to more people about setting the trust up and saying, let's not pay you an income for life. Let's pay you an income for 10 years or 12 years or 15 years or maybe even only seven years. You know, how much income do you need and for how long? What's reasonable for you? And that the reality is it's much better for the charity. And it may also provide a significant tax benefit up front when you start looking at cost value of money. It may even be better for the individual. So for example, I have one client I worked with and they, they, were, they were looking at a, at a trust. The client, the donor has now accepted a seven year trust at 10% but it's only for seven years. So they're actually going to get significant money in that seven year time frame. And then the charity will get money at the end of that seven, at the end of that seven years, significantly less than they would have gotten if he lived for 28, life expectancy was 28 years. But when you start looking at present value numbers, it actually was beneficial for the donor and for the charity. So finding creative ways to think, think things can be done sooner, because we, as we talked about, we have 50,000 people over 100 years old now. People are living longer and longer, and, and, and we know if they're wealthy, they're going to live even longer. And those are the people that we're talking to. And Robert Sharp, my boss, I, I love one of his comments. Is, you know, anybody who's got a lot of money, you know, if they, if they first sneeze, they're on their G6 to Mayo. Now, point out to them, there's actually a G7, isn't it? I think that's the newest gen, G7. So, but, uh, but anyway, the point is, you know, we know that the, the groups that we're working with are wealthier and have better access to health. So, uh, okay, so then there's the finder's fee game. You have somebody who comes to you and says, you know, I have this client who's going to give you, he wants to set up this life income plan, but he really doesn't have any association with charity. If you pay me a fee, I'll make sure he gives it to your hospital account. Wouldn't that be fantastic? And, you know, it's only 5%. You know, it's $100,000 trust. Just pay me 5% of all you need. Well, <clears throat> I don't think anybody here has accepted that, but obviously that's a good one. Um, commissions for gift planners, all those incentives, all those different pieces. But I do want to talk just a minute. I think there has been some growth um, for organizations, for employees that work for nonprofits to actually be paid an incentive. I know when I worked for Russ President Luke's in Chicago, we did a big capital campaign and they said, hey, if we, if we as an organization reach our goal, then we're going to give everybody a percentage of their salaries. So I think there are, more, there are really three ways, and this comes from the AFP and the way they, they see that there are opportunities. So it can be a percentage of salary. There can be non-financial indicators. So in other words, it can be how many donors do you see, um, you know, how many, uh, you know, a series of non-financial goals. And if you meet all of those, and it can be donor calls and visits and activities and that kind of thing, then you can pay you a percentage. And then the, the final one, which seems to be getting a little bit more attention is the weight and rate system. So let's say you spend, uh, let's say, I mean, how many of you do plan giving full time? Just a couple. How many of you also do major gifts? Also do annual gifts? So maybe you spend 40% of your time doing plan giving and 30% of your time doing annual gifts and 30% of your time doing major gifts. So the idea would be you have a goal for each of those different categories and we'll pay you an incentive if you meet the goals for each of those three categories that way. So, <clears throat> donor gifts, I got to think the message here is make sure you acknowledge your donors in a timely fashion. Make sure it's accurate. 
they come to an event, obviously part of that's not going to be a tax deduction. Make sure it's right. Uh, just a couple comments about how many of you are familiar with the uh, model standards of practice from the DPT? If you've not seen that, please take a few minutes to read that. I think it's really a strong message in terms of how we're ethical as an organization. And the other one is the AFP Code of Ethical Principles and Standards. Uh, it's another, it's a little bit more elaborate. It gets into a little bit more general fundraising and some of the things, some of the do's and don'ts in our business. Um, but I think all really beneficial. Um, okay, so now I want to talk just a little bit about how many of you had a situation where you named a building or you did something for somebody and then it turned out maybe that's not something we want to happen long term. That is what I'm talking about. I want to share a couple of stories. One of them is Vanderbilt University. I don't know how, how familiar you are with this, but Confederate Memorial Hall. And it's kind of interesting, the Daughters of the Confederacy gave them $50,000 in the 1800s. And <clears throat> the idea was for women to be able to come to school, it actually was technically part of what was called Peabody College, which is now owned by Vanderbilt. But <clears throat> this became a huge lawsuit a number of years ago. Somebody finally one day said, you know, this is really not appropriate for us to have African Americans on our campus and for us to have a Confederate hall. So <clears throat> they, they said, we're going to just call it Memorial Hall. Well, then there was a countersuit filed by the, the daughters of the Confederates who said, look, we did this with the full intention of helping women be educated. We never made a stand about what their race should be, and we shouldn't be penalized for that. So I went to, went to the court, actually ended up in the Supreme Court in Tennessee, and, and they said, Vanderbilt, you have to keep the name there. They did it with the right intention, and this is our message, and so still called Confederate Memorial Hall. So it's interesting, but it was a big debate for a number of years. And the other one is uh, Simpkins, Simpkins Hall in the University of Texas. And, you know, this is an example of a guy who, who was ethical at one point in his life and then maybe not. So the short answer is he was really involved with the KKK. He was a big leader. So, but what's fascinating about it is nobody really knew this until, what, five, six years ago? Yeah, you know what the time frame was? And one of the law professors at the University of Texas did some research and found out what this guy's history was and said, how can we have a building on our campus named after him? This is really inappropriate. So the good news is they've not changed it. But, <clears throat> but, you know, ongoing issues in terms of, you know, where do you cross that line when you have somebody who comes in and does something and, you know, happens, do they become a criminal? You know, there's some organizations that won't name, that leave naming opportunities only for those people that have passed away. But then you don't have that issue, I guess. Of course, you may be so they become a criminal. So here's a picture of some of their buildings. And then I talked a little about Russell James, um, the 20 year study, almost over 12,000 deaths in that. 80% um, of the mature bequests for his research are over 80 years old. So again, that message that they're older. And 65%, here's one of the other interesting things 65% of the people who give money to charity in their will have traditionally not been to charity. I think we, we at one point had this perception that you can talk to somebody when you're younger, they'll name you and they will, and then you, know, you don't have to worry about it anymore. We know it's a revocable gift. Obviously, if you want to be in, in the first will or the last will, <laughs> the only one that counts is the last one, right? So, so message, there are a number of people, obviously, if you cultivate somebody and steward them properly. And, and, and here's the other, I'm not saying you don't talk to people that are 40 who are interested in you know, talking about the request, but if somebody says to you, I'm going to leave you my will, and they're 40 years old. What does that say about your institution? They essentially named you as a member of their family, 40 years old. That's a huge, they're a huge candidate and prospect for a larger gift maybe later in life, or a potential major gift. Uh, one of our research data is interesting. In the academic arena, <clears throat> most of the people who make a planned gift, or the majority of the people that make a, I'm sorry, the majority of people that make a planned gift to a university have traditionally not made their first gift until they're after 50. So again, a message that you got to build relationships with people, but it's also about life cycles. They reach a point in time when they start thinking about these things. And legacy, as we know, is a lot of times not until they're 70 or 80 or maybe older. It's amazing many people I'm working with now that are over 90 and still really sharp in terms of how they're making some of these decisions. So, and the other message is 65% of the people who leave money to charity and will have been asked. And the reason they say they're is because somebody asked them to. But if you don't ask them, um, the other quick comment or two about Russell, and this is something I don't think gets as much attention, and this is going to be a bigger issue. We talk a lot about the baby boomers, but as Russell calls it, the baby baby bus. Between 1924 and 1933, when we had the Great Depression, 
there was a real drop in our birth rates in the United States. So why does that impact us? Well, think about that. Now, my father was born in 1931. He'll be 85 this year. The majority of the people who make charitable requests live in their mid to late 80s. So in all candor, we're going to see a drop in traditional bequest gifts in the next five years. For most, On a national level, that may not be true for your individual institution, but there just weren't as many people born. So there may not going to be as many people <coughs> who are going to be passing away. The baby members are still too young. One other comment about Russell's, there was a little bit more popularity now with traditional revocable trusts, not traditional wills. Um, that's a trend we're seeing. Knowledge matters more than ever more that you do. And this is just one final stat on age of donors. You see how trending older and older. Was that show? 86% of the people are over 70 years old. And then I guess just a couple of quick comments, and then we're going to do some case studies. These are a few of the people that I admire for some of the stuff that they've done. Dean Smith, who many of you may know, passed away recently. He was a basketball coach for the University of North Carolina from 1961 to 1987. What's fascinating about him, you know, he's kind of a humble guy. Number one, he left a lot of money to charity in his will. But number two, during his lifetime, 94% of the kids who went through his college program graduated from the University of North Carolina, which we won't mention the coach in Kentucky, what he does now. But um, another ethical issue, right? But what's also interesting is that he wrote special notes to every one of those kids that graduated from his program when they got married, when they had their first child, when they had their second child, for their anniversaries. I mean, just incredible communications with them about life. And his message, his message as, a, as a coach was all about working together and doing the right thing. If you follow basketball, it's, it's kind of fascinating to watch. Have you ever seen somebody, when they, when they score, and somebody passes it to them, so an assist in basketball, he scored, and the guy who, who scores the basket will turn and point to the guy who gave him the ball that thanked him. That was a Dean Smith image. He's the first one to do when they actually huddled together before they shoot free throws to sort of support the guy before he shoots his free throw. That was another Dean Smith image. There are four or five of things like that that he really created in terms of you know, messages and working together. And then the final guy, <coughs> if you're familiar with Randy Couch, for those of you who have not seen the last lecture or read the book, uh, pancreatic cancer in his early 40s, and in, in the academic world, as you reach you know, the final stage of your career, you get a last lecture, sort of your message. And he talked about his childhood dreams and how he made a lot of those come true. He had young children, and he wanted that to be his message. But the, the quote that I love for him is he said, you can't change the cards you're dealt. You can only play your hand. So play with that. So anyway, okay, I'm going to end there, and then um, I'm going to hand out some uh, case studies. So we'll try and do a few of these. I know we're not going to have time to get to all of them. Um, and see if we can have a little discussion about some of the chewing gum. So if you guys will take just a minute or two. Yeah. Oh, you already got you. You guys are, you, you're, the, you're the in crowd. So if you take just a minute and read through, we'll try to do one or two of these. Um, and again, just a discussion about some real life things and things that happen. Um,
Okay, so Beth, let's talk a minute about the first one. <clears throat> so how does the ED respond to the situation? If you're the executive director, what do you do? Uh, so my first thought was that they should have been able to call short answer is if you want to be, you know, the, the most ethical answer is to just refuse to do it, regardless of how the, the advisor may respond. And, you know, the other message here for those of you who have any kind of written policy, you know, we talked a little bit about um, gift acceptance policies, you know, maybe this is something you need to think about, how you include some of this. You know, <clears throat> you know an easy out would be, it's against my organization's policy for me to receive any personal gifts, and that, that's a written form and you can communicate that to this guy. Kind of, and it's kind of black and white. But, um, you know, the reality is there's a lot of gray. Because it does tell me how these presentations are going. But, yeah. Well, I'll just answer the same other question. Because even if the man were right. uh, one of the bullet points, it says, doesn't make a difference if they give you $100, $1,000, or $100,000. So now let's let's back up for a little second. All right. Yeah, sure. <laughs> That's an example. I don't think Okay. So if I understand Zero, correct. Right. Donor wants to leave the executive director a thousand dollars. And so we think, okay, well we will reduce that check. Let's say your let's say you have somewhat ambiguous um, gift acceptance policy. So now you go and you refuse to check with your dad is only a thousand bucks. Nobody can just leave. But if I was get a one hundred thousand dollar check and I refuse that, or I give it to another charity. My board chair or somebody might have a problem with me for giving away $100,000 to a charity. If that was the spirit of the intent of the donor wanting to give that money, they put it in writing. I'm They're giving it to you, you not to a charity. I mean, I don't think it matters. I mean, I think even $10 basically was, I mean, I still think it's just a piece. But my neighbor's black nurse, and this uh, is not going to be Somebody actually wants to leave me that, that, that gift in 
in my own mind that part of something was going to say, unless it's in because I was a senior citizen the entire time. They really fall in love with us people like that. And so I can't prevent someone from writing me into the will and give me a chunk of money. I would never take it and go buy myself a car or anything like that. But I would, if somebody actually went and did that, there's a part of you that would say, well, hey, I'm not keeping it for myself, but you left it for my charity. Money was still given to you, not the charity. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's the big issue. But again, I, I mean, my message is you ought to have something in your gift acceptance policies that, as an employee of the organization, you cannot accept personal gifts. You know, they, you know above fifty dollars or whatever. You know, if they want to give me a token, fifty bucks. That's one thing. Um, you know, or, you know. But you know, you we have these kind of. I mean, you know, what, what do you do if you have? I mean, I have charities all the time. I mean, I, I, as a gift player, I have. Certain circumstances all the time where somebody would say, well, they, you know, want to go visit a donor in South Florida, for example. Oh, well, please don't spend the money on a hotel. Stay with me. You know, is that the right thing to do? Yeah, I mean, I think you have to be very careful about Especially that. Especially when the donor has a medical emergency. If you have that happen? It sounds like you have. Yeah. 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 But lots of shades of gray. Lots of shades of gray. <laughs> So, you know, you just have to, I think at the end of the day, you have to kind of step back and look at yourself in the mirror and say, is this the right thing to do for the donor and how can I kind of live with this? Maybe there is a board member or a boss, hopefully, so you can, but there are lots of issues. You know, there was a story not too long ago with a guy, not unlike this, not too unlike this, and he was left half of an estate. It was a, it was a widow, and she left him $3 million. This is a pretty well-known charity, frankly, about four years ago. And he terminated his job at the charity and took three million dollars. Where's that choice? <laughs> he said, "I'm out of here." You know. Yeah, on all the boards that I, I serve on, they've never gone gone over to just get this policy. What happens? We don't know as board members. We may know morally, but they are teaching us as trustees and board members. And because I was a first now manager, I know the lines and the shades of gray. But the average board member does not know that, that you don't accept Well, there is, I mean, conflict of interest policy is helpful because, yeah. so we're, we're making it sound like it's black and white, you don't accept it, but let's just change the scenario a little bit. Say the donor is, um, knew the ED before she became ED. They were friends before. They had a pre-existing relationship. Sure. Maybe they're even, you know, 30 second husbands or some such thing. Right. Still, okay, so that changes the scenario quite a bit in right. terms of uh, whether uh, the ED should accept. Because that puts the ED you know, wearing a different hat as to right. who she is in relation to this donor. She's not just the charity's ED, she has a different relationship. Right. Well, in fact, maybe the woman even gave to the charity because. Right. Yeah, let's say they left half a million dollars to the charity and gave you about a thousand dollars. And you knew them prior to that relationship, so you know then maybe. So again, every situation is a little bit different. And I apologize we didn't get to as many of the case studies, but you're welcome to take those and read them okay. on your own time. Yeah. Well, but I have a gift to you. Oh what? That okay. you now need to accept and cannot refuse. Okay. <laughs> 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 right. Yeah. So